there anyone else recording? Seeing none, please put that in the minutes. All right. Um, no public comments. All right, consent agenda. So you still have a couple people that are still trying to connect, I think. Okay. But Mike, aren't you here? You've got to help me find people on the screen that are oh, waving yeah. their hands at me. Mike's actually here, so don't worry about Mike. I just see another just one. Megan, Megan, here, I, I would go ahead, Jane. Okay. Um, consent agenda. Warrants number AP2311S, AP2311, AP2310, AP2310S, PR2304. Special one day alcohol license, nonprofit wine and malt for the Friends of the Hadley Council on Aging. Wine tasting fundraiser October 28th from 6 to 8 at the Council on Aging, 46 Middle Street. Special one-day alcohol license for profit, wine and malt, Leadfoot Brewing, Patrick Randall, October 1st, noon to 8 p.m. at Craft Fair, Maple Valley Creamery, 102 Mill Valley Road. Pull that out, please. All right. Pulling that out. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of that one item for discussion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have to roll call that? No, nope. Joyce is not on. Okay. Aye. Okay. Okay. Discussion on Leadfoot. So my concern with that is I see at craft fair. So do we know if said craft fair has been approved by anybody? Like did they get a permit? Per yeah. I mean they have uh, the right to sell their ice cream. They have the, the food truck there that is uh, in, uh, the legality is in contention. <laughs> and now we've got a craft fair that we know that I know nothing about. I, I'm wondering if anybody knows anything about it. No, I don't have any information on that. That does not mean, since that op the licensing office has been vacant for a few days, yeah. I can't provide you that answer. Okay. Do they have to have a special license for a craft fair? I can't answer that. I do not know. I think it, in the past, at a minimum, we've asked for, you know, you know, law enforcement to make sure that they have any traffic concerns, if the fire chief has any concerns, if they're putting up a tent, the building inspector might be involved. So usually there's some level of contact. Tent screen. Yeah, so I don't have an issue with the Leadfoot Brewing. They, I mean, they've been there almost every week. That's not an issue. But this craft fair is a concern. And I, mean, I would, ha I, I guess, I mean, I would be okay with approving the brewing with the side note that the uh, uh, craft fair is questionable as to its permitting, permitting or whatever appropriateness. Mm -hmm. So it's we have a week and a half. We could approve it pending appropriate uh, permitting for the craft fair. But I don't, I think this is a separate thing though. They're just asking for the license to sell Leadfoot Brewing. The craft fair would be something, a completely different line item. I, I agree with that, Amy, yeah. 100%. That's why it's, I'm, I'm okay so, with the Leadfoot Brewing. I just want to put the craft fair on notice yeah. that that potentially is not an approved use. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to support the approval of the one-day alcohol license. Yeah, alcohol license. Um, <laughs> but would suggest that our licensing coordinator or their delegate um, reach out to, is it Patrick Randall? Well, it's no, not really, it would I be think Bruce Jenks. Oh, it's Bruce Jenks, okay, right, yeah. Maple Valley Creamery, to get more information and determine whether or not a permit is necessary. Okay. 
So we, so I moved to approve a special one-day alcohol license for profit wine and malt at 102. Well, I just moved that. Yeah. Well, you want to second it? Oh, I'll yeah. second it then. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. DPW Building Feasibility Committee. So I can give a little bit of an intro to yes. this. Yes, Carolyn, to, like to, give to remind intro. everybody about a year ago, I think, um, we uh, went into a contract with um, Weston and Sampson for a feasibility study for a DPW building or facility. So we've been working with them, Scott and I, and some other um, representatives from the DPW. And we're bring, he's, um, Mike and Jamee are um, here to give you a, a kind of an update of where we're at, what happens with the feasibility study, what's next, and some suggestions for the select board regarding a DPW feasibility study and outreach. So how's that for an introduction? Fantastic. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Can I share my screen? Post this. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Richard, um, and with me tonight is, is uh, Jamee Lee. Uh, I am the discipline leader for the facilities group at Weston and Sampson. Uh, the facilities group specializes in public works. It's, it's what we do. We have about 15 architects and 15 engineers, and 90% uh, of our work is public works, and it involves the, the planning, uh, design, and support of construction of new facilities, plus operations consulting that we do. So as, as Carolyn mentioned, about a year ago, we were, we were hired by the town to start a feasibility study, knowing that uh, the existing facility is going to be in need of, of replacement or repair someday in the future. We want to get this process started. So we're here tonight to just give you an update on where we are in that process. Thank you. Um, I put together an agenda just to keep us on track. Uh, I'm going to talk about the responsibilities of the public works, the existing conditions that we found when looking at the facility. Uh, the benefits of replacing the facility, and what are the next steps as we move forward. So um, the Department of Public Works consists of five different divisions. Um, highway, building maintenance, equipment maintenance, water, and wastewater. The focus of our study is really on the top three groups there. Um, highway, building maintenance, and equipment maintenance. We're not focusing so much on water and wastewater because they're going to stay at their existing facilities. Um, but there is going to be some overlap with vehicle storage and other needs, other needs that this new facility will, will house. Um, I'm not going to go through the different responsibilities of each of the, of each of the disciplines. The important takeaway here is that the, the DPW touches the lives of every resident, of all the residents every day. And that's something that we see a lot of people overlook. From the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed, everything you touch from the water, the roads, the cemeteries, school grounds, all been impacted by public works. APWA reporter said it best. They said, uh, public works is the first responder who are there until the emergency is over. And what often people overlook when we, when we approach people about a new facility is that they're first responder. A lot of people don't think of that. And it's a presidential directive through the Department of Homeland Security that defines them as a, as a first responder. So the other thing that we think of when we talk about TPWs is that they're on call 24 hours a day. And oftentimes what we think of is snow and ice. Everybody says DPW, they plow our roads, they salt our roads. What people don't often think about is the other stuff they, they, they do in terms of the, the storm cleanups, the road cleanups, the accident responses, etc. In fact, they support 
all the other emergency departments. And just like we said in the first, in the, in the last slide, they're the first responder who are there until the emergency's over. First one in, last one out. I'm gonna turn it over to Jermaine now, who's gonna talk about the existing facility. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we had the opportunity to visit the uh, existing DPW facility to get a better understanding of the current operations and capacities and also um, the maybe downfalls or uh, uh, areas of improvement that could be made in the um, study. So we visited 230 Middle Street, which houses the DPW admin as well as the highway department, and there's an existing water treatment uh, facility there as well. Um, just going to do. Thank you. Um, so we took a look at the facilities that are currently on the site, uh, mostly being three um, temporary trailers that have been housed, um, have, have been housing the staff for the past 20 years, um, and a facility that was built in the 1960s that serves as a vehicle maintenance and storage garage. Um, these buildings are outdated in a way that they do not accommodate the current DPW needs, um, including overhead door clearances for modern day equipment, um, uh, enough office and uh, employee facility <laughs> spaces um, to house the staff, uh, including locker room areas, that, which are currently part of the garage space, um, toilet facilities for the, um, I think 14 staff, 15 staff that are there, um, as well as a break area uh, for downtime, including um, storm events and emergencies that might require rest and respite and on-call 24-hour services Mike was talking about earlier. Um, sorry, thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Too eager. Um, in terms of the maintenance facility that is on site, um, the DPW is currently responsible for the maintenance of all town-wide vehicles, including school buses, which unfortunately do not fit in the bays um, due to the overhead door clearances. So there is not enough um, room and vertical room and horizontal room to accommodate the full uh, capacity of the town's fleets. Um, and the storage garage also limits the indoor storage, which provides longevity to the, the town's fleet, which is a uh, massive capital investment. Uh, excellent, thank you. Currently there is a uh, pole barn on site, which is an unheated space, which is a great indoor coverage uh, facility for the fleet, but does lead to potential delays and mobilization for these on-call emergencies that the town is responsible for. Um, and pieces of equipment such as the Vactor truck, which is um, a fairly expensive piece of equipment, uh, is not accommodated in these current um, storage facilities as it is too tall and uh, sits out year-round uncovered, uh, exposed to all the elements throughout the year. Um, another important aspect to maintenance of the vehicles is a wash facility, which can get the grime and salt off of the trucks to prevent from rusting, um, creating a longer uh, lifespan for the trucks. Um, that is not currently um, available to the facility and the DPW. Um, it is mostly a rinse down and, it, and is majorly limited by the weather. Um, and lastly, the two other site elements that are um, a full town service that are housed at the 230 Middle Street site are the salt operations for the snow emergencies and also townwide fueling dispensers, which have reached the end of their useful lifespan. Um, the salt dome itself is limited by the site access and the traffic for uh, prop or, um, efficient mobilization during uh, said storm events. Um, so currently in our feasibility study, we have conducted staff interviews and have determined based on the needs of the um, town's operation, what the programming necessary for a new DPW facility would be. And we are currently in the process of narrowing down a series of town-owned sites um, and providing conceptual uh, site layouts, building diagrams to best prioritize the town's needs. Um, yes. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll take over. Yeah, sure. So um, what, does, what do you get when you get a, when you get a new facility? Um, well, number one, you're going to get a safe environment for your employees. Um, a lot of these substandard facilities, they, they don't have current safety standards and they are uh, deteriorating around, around the folks that work there and creating uh, very unsafe environments. 
Um, protection in the town's multi-million dollar investment in their fleet. Uh, Jamey was just talking about, um, about the fleet and the importance of protecting it. Um, the town's invested multi-millions of dollars into this fleet and you want to protect it as best you can to make those vehicles function when you need them to and to uh, project, protect the longevity of those vehicles. Better serve the public through response times. Uh, that's another important thing. You don't have this downtime with equipment, your, your crew is able to get there uh, quicker under an improved facility. Water quality, uh, the existing facility has virtually no, um, it's not up to standard with water quality. So a new facility would bring this, the existing facility, would, would bring uh, the stormwater system up to compliance. And it stops it or eliminates uh, band-aiding the existing facility. Uh, you don't need to keep putting improvements into a facility that's substandard for your operations. And you, it would be replacing a facility long, that's long past its useful life before it becomes a mandated emergency. So I do have some photos of uh, what the existing facility looks like versus what a proposed facility looks like. Um, we did gray out the existing facility for effect. It actually just it actually it actually just helps differentiate the different the difference between the existing and, and proposed. So um, here's some examples of the office space as we we talked about before. The office space is generally trailers, right? And I believe the town looked at replacing those, and the cost was 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 frightening to say the least. Um, you can see a new a newer facility. We we try to bring as much daylight into possible and daylight in as possible, uh, makes for correct, uh, much better working environment um, and much better efficiency in the space. Uh, on the left you see the kitchen in the, in the break room. Um, this kitchen and break room is for 17 to 25 people roughly. Um, can you imagine fitting 17 people in that, in that kitchen up there? Um, on, on the right is what we try to do on a modern, modern facility, although these ones might be a little bit bigger than what we would have here in Hadley. Um, but we try to create efficiency with creating multiple uh, multi-use spaces. These rooms are not just your kitchen area, break area, it also serves as a training room for the entire staff. Here is the uh, locker, locker shower toilet facilities for your your 17 to 25 uh, staff. Um, this is uh, woefully inadequate for for um, for the staff, and this does create inefficiencies when people are waiting to get in line to go to the bathroom. And here is uh, on the left is the maintenance bay. Um, you know this this serves the whole the whole town fleet. Um, except for the fire department. Um, on the right is a modernized facility. You can see the, the clearance height there. That allows, build, that, that allows the vehicles to be lifted to their full height and allows the mechanics to get under it. Um, it's much more efficient in space. Not only that, the environmental compliance in that space and the, and the air rate turnover is, is uh, up to code. On the left is the current vehicle storage, and uh, there's inefficiency here. Um, we've had studies done on other departments where they lose an hour on each end of the day just moving equipment around because it's all blocked in with each other. Um, that is, I mean, that's that's two hours out of the day for every, you know, for, for your employees. Uh, that is that is very inefficient. Very inefficient. On the right, what we try to do is we try to get single stall parking. Um, we store the plows right in front of the vehicles. That protects the plows, they're not outside. Um, protects the longevity of those, protects the longevity of the vehicles. Um, keeps snow and sun off of these vehicles and protects the longevity of those and increases response times. And here is um, the wash bay on the left. Um, I, I'm not quite sure exactly how that is used, whether it's used outside or inside. Uh, inside, you're creating um, a, a deteriorating condition. Um, outside, you're, you got a stormwater issue. Uh, so a modernized facility, it, all that water is contained into tight tanks or into the sewer system. Uh, not only that, you're, in an, you're working on the inside and you're in a situation where your employees are going to be more apt to wash the vehicles and clean them the way they need to be cleaned versus uh, the system that you currently have. 
So what are the next steps for the project to move forward? Well, we gotta wrap up the, uh, the feasibility study and the concepts. We gotta come up with a site um, and, and put the town in a direction moving forward. Uh, we need to form a DPW committee. Um, a DPW committee is, is essential to moving these projects forward. Uh, we want uh, the committee to ask questions, understand the project, support the project. Um, they're gonna make sure that we're giving the right facility for this town. Then we begin the public outreach campaign. We want the residents to understand and support this project as well. That's very important to the success, success of this project. And then secure the next days of funding at town meeting or whenever fits in the town's capital plan. And that's it, any questions? Do you have any sites proposed currently? We've looked at a number of sites, and, and Jimmy, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, one of them being the existing site. Um, but we are, we are looking at some other sites as well. Yes, I believe uh, there are two on Bay Road, and there is one um, where the new fire station was completed in 2019. Um, a lot of those sites have shared municipal services, so whether it would be the existing site with the water treatment plant or with the fire station or with another um, well site or treatment facility, it's all, we're looking mostly at town-owned sites so that you don't have to allocate additional funding to purchasing. Um, so we have a few that we can, um, we need to review for priorities um, to figure out what the town would like to, what adjacencies would make sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn, where do we uh, stand with funding for the next phase? Is that? I would like it to go on the annual town meeting this year. At annual town meeting? Yes. This spring. Okay. That is, we've spent a lot of time with that in the in-house finance, and I think we've even talked about it when you and Amy Feiden have um, joined us, um, that the timing for that is with, that, with our debt service, that um, with these existing buildings, because we're looking probably another year or two before actually borrowing for that. So right now is really the best time. We also are in trouble with those trailers. They're, we can't replace them, and they're just, you know. They're really bad. Uh, yeah. 20 years is not correct. They've been there more like 30, I think. 40 at least. Right. I've been here 40 years and they were there. Yeah. So for site-wise, um, were you looking at one site for all of it or potentially multiple town sites? So I, I, as I understand it, we have not considered dividing up the program at, at this point in time. Okay. Um, many communities do get into that situation, so that's not unusual. Uh, our first objective is to try to keep uh, the divisions as together as possible, because that creates not only efficiencies in operations, but also efficiencies in construction. Any other questions? If I can just, um, we've talked about who should be on that committee. So I'd love you guys to share your experience. You, you know, I've shared who I think should be on it, and uh, definitely, obviously, DPW and building, but. So um, in our experience, it's, it's very helpful to have, um, um, you know, members of the Board of Selectmen as, or a member, a representative of the Board of Selectmen, perhaps a representative of the Finance Committee, um, other people that are actively vested in, in the town. It could be a former um, um, Board of Selectmen or other committee um, member. Um, we've had even like president of the youth soccer on, on the club. People that have an active interest in the community and will will take an interest in this project and help guide the decisions that move this forward. How big a committee do you think is the most appropriate? Very good question. Uh, five to seven, generally. Any other questions? Uh, no, I don't. Think thank you that very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm hoping that you would come up with some suggestions of um, board members or representatives that should be on that committee I'll tonight. Do I'll do it if nobody else wants to. I mean, I'll do it if, even if anybody else wants to, but I would 
be very willing to be on that committee. Does that work for you? Works for me. Does that work for you? Yeah. Congratulations, Randy. Thank you. <laughs> so then, my suggestion would, just as Mike and, and has indicated, I think somebody from finance, somebody from capital, we can leave it up to those boards. Mm -hmm. um, I do, um, obviously I think Scott should be on it. Um, I would also like to see um, Gary on it. I think it's important the building person should be on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think uh, on two, three, four, five, I think you need, um, who's missing? Two citizens. Town, two citizens. Town two town residents. Citizens. Yeah. Two residents. Community members. Yeah. Make it an odd number. So that's you have that's seven, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Two more, yeah. Mm -hmm. so if you'd like, I can move forward with that, and then if uh, you have some suggestions or you talk to anybody who's interested or anybody who's watching this meeting would like to be interested, mm -hmm. we can bring those names at the next select board meeting and you guys mm -hmm. can formally put together a board. But I'll seek, I'll, I'll talk to Capital, to Paul, and I'll talk to Amy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Send me something so I can put on Facebook. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. All right. Russell School survey proposal. Courtney and Dan are here. Join us at this table where you get recorded, please. formed Russell School Committee. Uh, we started meeting about two months ago or so, um, and we've put together a survey, which hopefully all of you have had, have had a chance to look at. Um, and the intention of the survey is to, to, to determine what the community wants to see happen with the building. So we identified five major options for the future of the school and would like the community to share with us what options they prefer. And the results, results of the survey will help us narrow down opportunities to pursue and the committee can go from there. Um, in terms of distribution, we will link to the elect electronic version of the survey on a small one-third page flyer inside the water bill sent to residents from the town. Um, I already received approval from Susan, the town collector, for it to be included in the um, November 1st water bill, going out to about 1,500 residents. And that um, the insert will include a bit.ly and also QR code for folks to scan, um, bringing them directly to the survey. We will also create full page flyers with more language introducing the survey and post them at local establishments like the post office, library, senior center, schools, dairies, and other businesses. Um, we'd also post at churches if this does not apply to separation of church and state. We'd also like to post it on the town website um, and we'll share on Hadley specific Facebook pages, um, such as You Know You're From Hadley and Hadley Mass commu uh, Community Page. And then um, her copy surveys will be available at the Senior Center and the Library for those who may not have access to a computer or smartphone. And our committee is willing to host hours at each location to help walk people through the survey <clears throat> on a computer. And the hard copies will be collected by the committee and inputted into the electronic version by um, Allison Dante Venman, who is a Hadley resident who helped us put the survey together. Um, and she specializes in, um, in surveys such as these. Um, and all responses to the surveys can be anonymous. Um, she says, no personally identifiable information is collected as part of the survey unless respondents include their contact information to receive updates from the Russell School Committee. Even when contact information is provided, it will be separated from the survey responses. No individual responses will be identifiable and all reporting from the survey will be in aggregate. So we as a committee have paid for the first month of the Survey Monkey and plan to re-up it uh, monthly as needed with the intention to close the survey by the end of the calendar year. We'd like to hold a forum for residents to attend uh, and learn more about the school and possible plans for the school after the survey has concluded. And our intent is to have the future of the school on the warrant for town meeting in the spring so a decision can be made and we can move forward. Any questions? 
Excellent, Courtney, you said the survey would be up and available through the end of the year? Is That's that what we're thinking, yes. Okay, all right, and then you compile it January, February timeframe and then? Yep, and report back. Report back, we'd make sure that there right. would be a warrant article held right. for the annual town meeting. I know one of the reasons they wanted to bring this to us was to see if there were any changes in the questions, the way they're written or other things that the select board feels would be appropriate to include on this. I think it covers. I think it looks really good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm impressed with the effort you put in so far. Very oh, nice. great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anything to add? All right. So the collector is. Um, do we need to um, look at anything like money in order to make printed copies or you have access to a printer somewhere or how's that going? Um, you know, that's a good question. I mean, we could always use some funding, otherwise we'll just take it out of our own pockets to get it done. Well, it doesn't seem appropriate. Okay. Town um, should be paying for that. Can we print things at Town Hall on the copy machines? It's just got to come out of somebody's budget. So it'd be 1,500 copies, but on third page, so we would need 500 copies. I'm sure if you did a little bit of outreach, you'd find some citizens willing to pitch in. So what's the, what's the total? You said 500? 500. Copies, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it looks like two-sided, that's it? How many pages when you printed out two-sided? Are you talking about the one the one-third page insert, or this? What we're going to what we're going to have survey. people pick up here and at the library. Gotcha. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's seven. So it'll be four double-sided pages. Can it be condensed? Because I know they're nicely spaced. Yes. Yes. It will definitely be condensed. Um, this is just the electronic version, and so we're going to have a different hard copy version available. Um, and I mean. I don't think we have to print several hundred at a time. We could do 25 at a time, and as we, I think we could um, figure it make out. our way through it, yeah, we yeah. can figure that out. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. we just did the housing production plan mm -hmm. survey, and I mean, there definitely were people who filled out the hard copy, but the vast majority went online. Yeah. yeah. I would expect the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's can I, uh, Yeah. Um, Content or approve you putting in a survey question? Approve the content, which is, I mean, it's, it's going, going to be a word with a link to go to and a QR code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to share that. Okay. What's your time frame for that? I want to work, do we need to do a vote based on, we might need to do a vote tonight. Yeah. She said the November 1st water bills. Yeah, so Susan said she'll need it by October 15th. Oh, okay, yeah. so we have time. We I, I'd, I'd rather since we meeting. didn't put that on the agenda for a for vote next. that we do that on the 5th. And mm -hmm. if you could have a sample for us for the meeting for the 5th of October. Sure, you got it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a draft started, so I'll, I'll send it over to you and we can go back and forth. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Anything from you, Dan? Not really. I'd just like to thank the select board and, and uh, for, you know, making sure that this uh, goes out in a timely manner. 
Uh, this is an important issue for this town, uh, for the town's future. Um, currently, the building committee and the townspeople have made all these new buildings possible. And, um, you know, I think we're in a good position now to pay attention to some of our historic structures. And the survey is the first step. And uh, with the town's approval, um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that this building stands for future residents to have use of it. And I, I much prefer this approach than an approach where it's more of like a referendum, like do you want to keep it or not, right? Because everybody in town doesn't know what all of the possibilities mm -hmm. are. So I think right. this is a nice really lays it out. Yeah, nicely. lays it out very nicely. But the most important thing is to is to stabilize the structure, and and that has to, you know, that has to be decided by the townspeople. So, mm -hmm. the fact that we get this out right away is super important. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, I'm willing to go over there and patch up holes. Um, you know, there's just it it, it deteriorates fast uh, when when it's neglected. So, um, if if we have this. You know, a, a decision by spring on which way to go. Then we know, you know, we can apply right away for for some CPA money to at least start stabilizing the structure, and that'll buy us the time we need to decide uh, what we can do with it. Um, so, was the last option a viable option, or do I, I'm sorry. Um, with the demolishing and selling, isn't it, was it considered a historical landmark or no? That specific parcel. That's a good question. Is I that, believe I don't, it's the the, the 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 village itself. The center of town is is more of a historic district. It's not necessarily that building. Right, but the selling the land, removing it from town. Well, the, we one, before, to do that? the one before. It's an option. It's a really bad option. idea, but no, it's but an it's, I didn't realize it was an option because <laughs> I thought it was actually considered like that parcel was a historical landmark for Massachusetts. That's a good question. We can look into that thing. I would double check on that. Yep. I don't know who would ask. I was looking to see if Dan, but he's not piping in, so. Okay. You didn't ask him well enough to pipe in. Dan, do you know if it's a historical building or lot? I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's, if it's on a historical register. Right? I know it's in the historic district. And, and if we need any kind of federal funding for it, 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 it can't be taken down. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, thanks for all your work on this. Anybody in the uh, Zoom audience makes comments? All right, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda is our discussion of um, changing our meeting style or maintaining it as hybrid versus in person. Any comments or thoughts? Um, It'd be nice to go back to in person so that we don't have all this setup time and equipment here. Um, I mean, setup and equipment is probably about the same. But I think the confusion of people getting into Zoom, people getting kicked out of Zoom, recording, not, I mean, obviously recording, not recording, but I just, there's just a lot going on. And I think there really isn't much of an excuse anymore to not show up if you have something to say. That's just my opinion. I prefer in person meetings, but about the rest of the board. Personally, I prefer in-person meetings. Although, with another meeting I was at, I was reminded by somebody else that the level of attendance has gone up as well. You know, so 
in terms of people, the number of people who are actually logging in, you know, watching the Zoom. But they also, there's a uh, capability now they're watching it back on channel mm -hmm. 190 or 190. Yes. Well, yep. Looks like Mr. Dwyer wants to speak, Jane. Okay. Bill I am going to speak strongly in favor of staying um, at least higher. Um, as a practical matter, you're making it really hard for people to come to your meetings, especially when you do your executive sessions at the beginning of the meeting. Um, uh, really, hybrid is, I think, essential. Uh, it's been a great boost for uh, participation. And I really think you owe it to the town to maintain at least a hybrid presence. Okay. Alex, our um, Hadley Media person, would like to speak? Yep. So first of all, I apologize. I cannot switch and speak at the same time. Um, but uh, I did want, did, did want to point out that um, so I'm on the Mass Access Board of Directors, and one of the things that we actually looked at is whether or not this would be a permanent thing. There was a bill in the legislature last session, and it could be a bill um, next coming session. So as long as we can, I, I would like to keep this be in practice if it, um, so that mm. if, if we, because if we stop, then hey, it's got to be mandated now. I really, I really don't want to reinvent the wheel, so I want to keep in practice, keep improving. Um, <coughs> that's just my thoughts. Okay. Thank you. Jenny and I would, I have Randy? So I prefer to be here, but I also agree with Mr. Dwyer that it's nice that people can have access to the meeting without having to come here. It's not necessarily convenient. Uh, it's good to see more faces at this meeting. And the only thing I have to say negative about the hybrid is that when we get something contentious and our clientele doesn't know how to behave themselves, but if we have the appropriate person, then no offense, Jen, behind uh, being the Zoom host that can uh, shut people off when as quickly as necessary, then I, I'm all in favor of keeping it hybrid. Other comments? Are we making a rule for ourselves as a board of selectmen? That's or are we also allowed to be hybrid as needed? I don't follow your question. Are we saying that, so we can continue to have hybrid meetings. Yes. Is the expectation that we are all here? I hear what you're saying. I, I, I would prefer that, and I think if there is a compelling reason that someone's out of town, someone's out of town, town whatever, that, but in. that would be an exception. Yeah, and, that, yeah, and that would be a legal question because if you go back to pre-COVID when um, we weren't, we had no idea about Zoom or any of this, it was, I, I'm not sure about this size board member, but only one person could be remote. And there's, I would have questions about the chair being remote at all. Yeah, because we have that remote participation <clears throat> policy. Right, Jen? Yeah. And I'm also <laughs> willing to say now, if someone wants to be hybrid and their stuff doesn't work, I'm sorry, you're cut off. We have a quorum here. That's how I feel about it. Just to keep things rolling. We had a time where we were waiting 25 minutes for everything to get up and rolling. And I think that if there's a quorum, physically in person and someone tries to be remote and they can't access it, too bad. Sorry. My time is very valuable, just like everyone else's. Yeah, I mean, I just think, I think, you know, we should ask ourselves what's the goal. And if, if the goal is to maximize participation, we talk about transparency, engaging the public as much as possible, being hybrid is a way to do it. Um, again, I'm perfectly happy to be here, but like Randy said, I don't want to impose on others. And the reality is, 
you know, if you can sit down at your kitchen table and eat and watch and know what's going on, I think people want to be able to do that and not be forced to come down here um, and disrupt their evening. So I, I think in that spirit, I'm very much in favor of keeping the hybrid. Unless we run into, you know, as Amy's saying, if, if we and, and Alex, if we're running into technical problems over and over and over again, then we maybe we reassess. But I, I think the best, I, I think the realistic approach to it is, um, um, if I can give my input, as not as a board member, but just what I'm seeing, and for me to prepare for our budget, I, I do see that we are definitely through um, having a new director. Um, getting very stretched thin, we are going to invest more in staffing for things like this. It's even even having to cover both offices as this past week and people needing Zoom links and I see the burden on that office um, that we are going to get, we need, we're going to need additional manpower to run all of these multiple meetings. So I just want to uh, give you the heads up that we'll approach that in the budget to, to make this work as best it can. There wasn't any uh, money from the states when they made the mandate. That you should. Of course not. <laughs> well, I, we could ask. And, and that was the biggest when they when they were insisting um, on on forcing towns that they had to continue to do hybrid. There was a lot of pushback from the small rural communities who just don't 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 have an Alex. They they don't have somebody to be sitting here and doing Zoom. So there was some pushback, and so that will I think that will can you continue to be a challenge for small towns that have not don't have the funding for it. But <laughs> yes, we got Bill, and Bill and Susan. Bill Go Bill, first. you first. Okay. Um, what, what, what I will say is that probably one out of every two or maybe three select board meetings, there is an issue involving planning board and having me be able to zoom in uh, allows you to perhaps get beyond that issue in five minutes rather than spending 15 minutes talking about it and then not having an answer. Um, I would not plan on routinely attending an in-person meeting, an in-person only meeting, but I'm happy to check in on the Zoom meetings and be available as a resource if needed. And if you don't need me, that's fine. I'm doing my own stuff, baking cookies or what have you. Um, so it, it, uh, it, it, no burden for me to zoom in. It is, would be a burden for me to come to every meeting just in case there was something that I could contribute. Ditto for the treasurer. Oh, uh, ditto for the treasurer. <laughs> yeah, well, my concern was uh, about volunteer boards. I think Amy was asking, are you making this policy just for the select board? Or are you going to impose it on other volunteer boards? Because I like capital planning, they're meeting only high, uh, they're only meeting on Zoom now. And there are a number of other boards that are only doing that. Uh, you know, we have enough of an issue trying to get volunteers to, to volunteer for these boards. Um, and if we make them meet in, in person, that, that might be a problem. So the, select board. So this is this yeah, this line item is strictly for, for select us. board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I make a motion to keep our meetings hybrid. Second. Is there a with the expectation that select board members are in person unless there's extren extenuated circumstances at which point they may log in on Zoom. But if their equipment is failing, we move forward with a quorum. We expectation quorum in person, right? I, I agree with that. Amanda. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be up to the chair from running the meeting. You know, I mean, there might be like a little leeway, but I, yeah, I mean, we don't want to be sitting there waiting while somebody's audio is not connecting right. forever. Okay, I have a motion. Molly seconded. I second it. Under second. Mm -hmm. Roll call vote or just vote? No, you can vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Neutral? Okay. Thank you. All right. 
Tremura Trail held, had cul-de-sac issue. Hello. Hello. Sharon, you want to just introduce yourself yes. and your address? Yes, sure. Yeah. You all have a packet in front of you. Yes. A very thorough packet. Um, packet. But as well as, I think tonight's going to be introducing the issue. And we do have uh, Mitch here and Chief Spank Naval um, to say where, where they are at and doing some due diligence, getting some background information. So, but Sharon okay. Okay. can articulate yeah. this very well. So my name is Sharon Stanton and I live at 100 Chamura Road. And I've lived there since, my husband and I have owned the house since June 20th, 2019. And, um, Obviously, you, you've heard why we're here. The, the parking um, has be increased tremendously, mostly this year. And um, there are other, there, there's, there have always been issues with people parking up there and things that stem from parking, but we've always just been able to just handle it pretty much ourselves. And now it's, um, it's real, this is really a parking issue. There's just 20 to 30 cars. Tonight there were about 16 cars, I would say, when I left. And um, this is getting to be more common. So it used to be, really when we moved there, there weren't that many cars parking up there at all for the trails. Now there are um, a lot more cars and a lot more people. But the people that are coming are not trail, like hikers or people um, bird watching or, you know, it's mostly all mountain bikers, all mountain bikers. So that's the issue is that, that we have is with um, the large number of cars because it now seems like it's a parking lot up there. And sometimes it seems like a park because a lot of people hang out after their bike ride and stuff, sometimes for an hour and a half. But, you know, I know, you know, that's not a crime. So is this a day, daytime thing or a nighttime thing? It's mostly the daytime at this time of year now that it's sort of in between. It's not cold enough that people aren't coming, but it's, you know, people are, people do come at, in the evening and go out with, lights on their bikes to do mountain biking, which supposedly um, the trails are supposed to be closed at um, dusk. And the, DC, the, the DCR trails, I think, it says half an hour before um, sunrise until half an hour after sunset, just like hunting. But, you know, sometimes people are out there later than that. Okay. And, you know, it just keeps I never plan to get so involved, but it just seems like everything that we um, look at turn, turns into something else. And so I was looking at you know, the, the cul-de-sac. Why is there a cul-de-sac there? And I did hear from the fire chief today who told me he doesn't really have any, he doesn't have any documents as to why, you know, whether or not that's for a fire turnaround or, or anything. So I guess we just have to look at it as it's a road, it's just a road. But part of the problem is that we're at the end and it opens up into this cul-de-sac. So there's lots of space there for people to come. And, and as, as I mentioned before, a lot of different places are sending everybody, even the town of Hadley is sending the people from the lower reservoir on the sign it says you can't park here unless you have a permit there's 15 rules and um, there's lots and lots of signs but they are sending people to either the notch visitor center which has a parking lot or to Chamura road and a lot of people the mountain bikers anyway they're they're definitely all coming up to Chamura road there are also a lot of um, mountain biking organizations even some just some um, smaller ones like Northampton Bike Club and they too have um, meetings and group rides. It's a, you know, it's, it's now become big groups that come. Big is, that, is that since it was designated as a trail with Kestrel? Yes, I would say so, yeah. 
We moved in in 2019, so it wasn't um, completed at that time yet, I don't think. It was still um, being process. worked out. Yes. And so now, as I think I mentioned in there, only about two weeks ago, I went and I looked at the trailhead sign and I noticed the, the emblems of all the, you know, the, the landowners, Amherst College, Hampshire College, et cetera. But then there's the New England Mountain Biking Association. And so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I was keeping up with things before we purchased the home. I was reading the articles and, you know, doing some research and I, I don't recall anything about you know, the, actual, the New England Mountain Biking Association, which has thousands of members um, being part of the whole, whole thing. And I think a mountain biker told me that the Mountain Biking, New England Mountain Biking Association does most of the trail work for the Kestrel. That's hearsay, but that's, that's what somebody told me. So, you know, now that, that it's like that, I, I think they sort of feel like they have an in on the, you know, can, can that I, it's their trails. Can I ask you about that? Sure. Particular? So I went to the site this afternoon just to be prepared for this meeting, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the trailhead sign, and I didn't see anything that specifically said this bike organization, but on the left-hand side of the sign, mm -hmm. it looks like a cannabis plant sticker. Oh. Right. It, it, is that true? I don't know about that. And then there's some above that. There's something else, and it's inside the glass, but the glass is not locked. So it appears to me that anybody could go there and put a sign if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And it's I would I guess it's up to Kestrel to come and police that because it's technically their sign. Right. So yes. I, uh, so I'm not sure about the validity of what I mean. I I, I believe your what you're saying about the bike sign being there, but I don't know that they had a, a legal or valid reason to put it there. Is what I'm well, no. About. I mean, because what's, it's where's it's, this from? Or what, yes, right? that's yeah. it. It that's it. So it's part of the you know the actual sign that was made by. Yeah, this is, this is inside the glass. That is inside the glass. The stuff that I'm looking at, okay, okay so that's the, the NEMBA is the bicycle. Right, Okay. So that's there's two, right. other, two other stickers on the glass. Yeah, I think I did see the one that looked like, I thought it looked like a, a cannabis. Yeah. But I don't, you know. Okay, so um, anyhow. So, Amy, do you remember, or were you listening in when we were talking to Kestrel and, um, Discussing this, I don't remember anything about bikes. The only thing I, I don't remember. The either. only thing I recall, and this is before I left the select board, when we were talking about acquiring other uh, the town-owned land, and Kestrel came in and they wanted to count that land. There was a kind of an informal subcommittee formed um, because I know. Um, the snowmobilers, the mountain bikers, right? <clears throat> there are a variety of groups that were concerned that their uh, access rights were going to be taken away. And they seemed to work cooperatively to come up with a plan that was acceptable to everybody. I, but you know, I don't know how formal that actually was. I think it was more to give the select board assurances that if we mm. voted, um, you know, that, that there weren't going to be major changes on that. So that would go back to what, 2020? 20, 20, yeah, 20, that's when I joined. 20, yeah, 2020. Um, so we might be able to find something at, at that point. I don't remember it having anything specifically to do with Chamorro Road. I remember the, the conversation about wanting to make sure that the snowmobilers had right of way. I don't remember hearing mm. anything about bikers, but I may not have been tuned into that at mm. the time. Yeah. And, that they, and that they have their logo here and the snowmobile club doesn't, I find interesting. Well, there's no, there, the, uh, the, tra the trailhead sign says hikers and bikers only. No motorized vehicles are allowed right. on this section. So. Before we get all wrapped up in all this, there's a couple of comments I would like to make as far as potentially legal stuff. 
So Chamura Road was formerly known as Cunningham Road. It was laid out by the county in 1947. And it basically, it's two rods wide, which is 33 feet, and it is straight road, or I mean, a, a, a consistent width from Hockenham Road to the end, and it stops in a rectangular position. It does not turn into a cul-de-sac. The assumption is that at some point in time, the town paved it for whatever reason, fire trucks, school buses, who knows. So there's a serious ownership issue that we have to understand before we can do anything about this uh, as a select board. And I appreciate your issues, but we have to be certain that if we make any kind of policy that we have the right to do it. I understand. Maybe I, we need to get a meeting with all of the so others. I, it's, out, it's actually what's happening now is, uh, you know, you can get uh, Chief Bank Nable's input and then Mitch's. There is some plant meetings planned. Okay. So, Mike, do you want to update them as far as you are and then uh, Mitch can? Okay, if I just stand. Oh. Sure. Uh, yeah, we actually had our building committee, uh, the progress committee meeting, so we discussed it there for a while as well. We kind of looked at the history of it, and again, I did the best I could for information for the records request. But um, the suggestion that I had made, and I know Mitch has already reached out to Amherst College, but there's multiple owners there. So there's the Kestrel Trust little lot, but there's also Amherst College, Hampshire College, Town of Hadley, and you know, there's a bunch of property owners there. So our recommendation at that meeting was to get them all around the table and see exactly what they're aware of, first of all, if they're even aware that their property is being used for motorized vehicles and mountain biking. Because I can tell you, we do have, I know public safety, we have, we have a concern. I mean, I understand that there's some parking off the road. I don't know when that was put in. The last time I was down there, it, you know, there were certainly cars there, but not in, at this, this amount. Um, the other concern we have, you know how dry it's been this, this, this year. Uh, you know, we kind of got lucky this year because across the state, the number of fires that they've had, it's enormous. And if we have vehicles driving up into this dry territory there, or people hiking, camping, we had a camping fire we had to go put out the other day out there. And, you know, I, we just need to get on board with the ownership of all this property and make sure that we're maintaining access, first of all, because we have a lot of bikers that we go out for with injuries quite consistently, at least two or three times a year, a minimum. Um, so I think we need to just get around the table and, and see exactly what's allowed so that we can maybe put a plan together of how we're gonna allow for parking, if it's gonna be designated parking areas so that the cul-de-sac is still accessible and, and all that. So I, I think, think we just need to get everybody together. DCR? DCR as well, too. Yeah, uh, I think they need to be involved. Yeah. Okay, Mitch, did you wanna to add to that? Thank you, I apologize for having to uh, appear remotely. My wife wasn't feeling good today, so I didn't want to leave her along with the kids for too, too long. But um, I did uh, have a conversation with Chief John Carter of the Amherst College Police last week. And it's, um, it was in my plans tomorrow to have a meeting with him and actually go out to the site. The, uh, the main uh, area that uh, in question here is uh, is on Amherst College property. So, uh, you know, there are some jurisdictional issues. Um, much like when we were dealing with issues on Mitch's Island, we found that the property was intersected on, you know, not only by a number of town property owners, but also uh, residents of Northampton. So uh, we're gonna try to work out with Amherst College, uh, either with the police or with the college, some type of agreement that allows for uh, us to be able to take action on their behalf um, or, or which is less likely, but uh, also potentially getting the Amherst College Police involved. Uh, again, they're, uh, they're very short staffed, so I don't think that that's very likely, but we are, uh, we are working together to move forward to get them at the table. Thank you. So I just, as an input, used to drive a school bus and I used that cul-de-sac to turn around in. When you go down Chimur Road, you, some of those driveways you don't want to go up to turn around. 
Of course she was a school bus driver. <laughs> what, what didn't you do, Jane? <laughs> but any other comments or questions? No, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, we don't want to leave you hanging, but it, there's more work to do on our end. Right. Yeah. I, I completely understand that. But thank that. you for bringing this massive, impressive, <laughs> right, but useful document to okay. us. Okay. Well, thank you for, for addressing this and helping us out with this. Um, and we will keep you apprised of what's going on. That would be great. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. You're right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. We need to amend a one-day alcohol license. They changed. It's actually the no. The, the, it was a misprint from the person who submitted it. That you've always approved their uh, their. Um, We've already done that. W well, we you we're just clarifying on the license what the time frame is. It's not gonna. Um, the time frame is not until um, half time. Half time is till the end of the third quarter. Okay. And that's for 10, 8, 10, 15, 10, 29, 11, 20. So this is just administrative Just correction. administrative, yep. Okay. Do you need a, uh, oh, yep, so, so it's right there, yeah. Motion to amend the hours of event of the October 8th, 15th, 29th, November 26th, special one day alcohol licenses for UMass top of the campus to read at the end of the third quarter intermission. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I have a random, just mini question. Um, is it because there was an amendment to it that it couldn't be on the consent agenda? Yeah, I was? think, okay. yeah. I probably put it in consent, but I wanted you guys to be aware of it and make sure you saw it. Okay. All right, Hadley Police Department, new hire, full-time officer. That would be Mitch. Mitch, you're on again. Thank you all. Um, I want to open just by saying that we uh, just wrapped up a extremely successful hiring process. Um, this is the first time since uh, since Chief Mason has been chief where we have gone uh, outside uh, to find full-time candidates. Uh, as a result of the new post commission and uh, the essential elimination of reserve police officers, we don't have the same internal pool to be able to choose from. And that was of a huge benefit to us as we were able to bring on officers in a reserve capacity, put them through our training process, and ultimately determine whether or not they were a good fit for our agency. And then when a full-time position came available, then uh, they would uh, very easily and very quickly slide into that open position and ultimately have to attend uh, a full-time police academy. So, with that, and also with the uh, with the union with the negotiating committee for the union contract, without getting too deep into that, uh, we were able to post um, a uh, a competitive salary range for our full-time uh, positions. We're wrapping up a hiring process for two full-time officers, and from that application process, we brought in nearly 20 applications from the outside and a t uh, five of which five of which were full-time academy trained so uh and uh, we were very fortunate to have two very familiar faces within that hiring process uh, which um, which made the process very easy uh, for selection purposes and as you know uh, very recently we uh, we brought back officer harry santiago and um, I'm, I'm pleased to, to say that we're bringing back uh, a very uh, familiar face to us as well. So I will start by saying that, the, uh, that this uh, request is for a conditional appointment. And this would be conditional on the completion of, uh, of Daniel Clark's physical and psychological examinations, as well as certification by the Massachusetts Police Officer Standards and Training Commission. Uh, this conditional employment will allow for the candidate to complete the necessary steps to become post-certified. And uh, those steps include the physical, uh, physical assessment, psychological examination, and the completion of, uh, of any in-service training. And once those are all completed, we can then submit to the post-commission and, 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 and get Dan Clark certified. 
So uh, Daniel Clark is a full-time certified police officer who was previously employed by the Hadley Police Department as a special police officer before uh, being offered a full-time position in the town of Ware. And uh, we are proud uh, that uh, we are proud that Dan Clark applied uh, to return to the town of Hadley and Chief Mason and I, as well as the officers that work with him here in Hadley are excited to reclaim him for the town of Hadley. And uh, with that, we ask that you accept um, his conditional appointment. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And uh, I know it's not I know it's not customary that uh, that uh, you you know ask the uh, ask any questions, but Dan Clark is here. I don't know if he actually got his camera to work, but he is uh, he is uh, here and had uh, and joined via Zoom. I I am here. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, Chief Mason advised me that I should look sharp and smile for the meeting and I promise you I'm doing both. Um, but I can't, I can't, I can't get my video to work somehow. I, I apologize. You're smiling. That's fine. You look good from here. Dan. I, I promise you. I promise you I am. Okay. Well, congratulations. And well, thanks back. for coming back. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. And civilian traffic control officers, Mitch. Thank you again. And, uh, Traffic control officers for the town of Hadley, these are civilian positions that are filled by uh, retired and prior police. And uh, those not familiar, uh, those also include uh, our fire department and uh, our, our, our full-time uh, fire department members are also traffic control officers. And this is helping extremely, uh, extremely well with our Route 9 project. Um, we are bringing on a number of uh, uh, several more traffic control officers this evening. Uh, the Route 9 project is in full swing, and we found ourselves last week um, uh, scurrying to find uh, officers to fill these roles. So um, we've had we've had significant interest in the traffic control officer position, and uh, and tonight we're recommending the. Uh, the hiring of six more. And uh, those six are uh, Michael Grabiak. He's a town resident and he's a retired court officer as well as a prior Hadley police officer. We are recommending William Chapman. William Chapman is a retired University of Massachusetts police officer. Some may, some may recognize this name, David Bertera. David Bertera is a town resident and uh, a prior happy police officer as well as a retired university of massachusetts police officer uh, we're recommending daniel hart he is a retired hampshire county jail superintendent as well as a Tom thomas roberts he is a prior springfield technical community college and mount Holyoke college police officer and last a michael grolensky he is a prior leverett and Bernardson police officer of civilian traffic control officers. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Thank Mitch. you, Mitch. Promotion of the acting DPW director to permanent DPW director. Jen, do you want to say anything? that you appoint Scott as the DPW director and lose the acting in his title. Oh, no. And should we do it subject to uh, final contract negotiations? Yeah, subject to the final contract, which is going out to the lawyer tomorrow. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. We have a That's motion. Amy's motion. Yeah. Amy made the motion. A second. All those, any conversation, discussion? Nope. It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
So we do get to shake his hand now. Right? Now we can shake your hand. So we've got to <laughs> shake somebody's hand. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. All right, we're going slightly out of order because we cannot close the warrant until we talk about Valley Bike on the warrant. Oh. No, we don't have any information about this. Um, we spoke last summer, this past summer, about Valley Bike and wanting to put their pad at Whole Foods, and they were looking for $4,500 from the town to um, pay for administrative <coughs> costs, and all the other costs were being met by the merchants. And there was no money in the town budget to do that, and so the conversation started about, well, let's put it on the fall warrant, but from there, I don't know how it sits. Did they decide that they wanted to put it at Whole Foods? Last I heard, they were thinking of the Holyoke Mall, maybe L.L. Bean. There was nothing really set in stone for a location, right? Okay, just checking. Yeah, they wanted to, right, there were options. But they, yeah, but they didn't, it wasn't a specific location yet. I, right? I have not heard from them. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, but, and I think the last we left off is we said that we would try to bring it to fall town meeting, but we haven't had discussions about funding or anything. This was part of how we would, how it would get funded. It would be put place on the, the, the warrant. Okay. So you have to decide. Um, I have not heard from them, so I don't know where it was when they had mm -hmm. talked initially about looking for response for businesses to support them, but since that last meeting, I have not heard. So can we vote to put it on the warrant and then... Oh, I can take it off. Like, yeah, 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 can you take it off or pass it I just want right this to be your decision of how you want to move forward. Yeah. So I don't want to put it on the warrant if it's not... If there's not a location, if it's not concrete, if there's no communicate, like I would take it off before. Take, take it off, yes. If we and, and I don't if we haven't heard from them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're voting today to put something on the warrant that is not specified. If only if they are proceeding their their location at the. It was in front of Whole Foods, right? That's the one you were discussing, That's correct? That's the one they talked to us That's about. That's the one you were that discussing was pointedly. Right. Yeah. Yes. The question was, when we put it on the warrant, it also was going to include, was the town willing to pay $4,500? And that was going to have to be put in somebody's budget so mm -hmm. it could be done. Right, or taken from free cash. or, or taken. Do we need to specify that in terms of how it goes on the warrant? Before it goes to the lawyers. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't have to be done today, but I want to. I just. I need some guidance on where you guys are moving because it was. I'm not clear. I think we need to to let the town vote on it. The question is, how is the best way to do that in terms of producing money? Because if the town is it's just a yes or no question, that's one thing. But if it's it's going to cost you, that's a different thing. I don't. I'm, I don't think we should put on the lawn at all this year until they have it more together. That's my opinion, but they don't have it together right now. I think they're waiting for us. I agree with No, that. because they haven't asked, they, they haven't given us a commitment from any business that they're willing to front any money. We left it with them that we were going to put it on the warrant. They had everything except the administrative cost covered. I don't think no, so. No, I think they didn't have any money it. from businesses. We had, we it wasn't their decision about putting it on the town warrant. That they weren't. I don't think they were part of that discussion. The, the last meeting, according to what I'm following, is that they were going to look at businesses mm -hmm. to support it first to see if there was other options. Since that meeting, I have not heard. I don't know whether um, Jennifer has, because she's been away, whether she had heard before, but I hadn't. But this has just been lingering, and I've got to get the warrant done, and we got to get closed up tonight. Well, they can I, wait a year. Yeah, I agree that we talked with them. We decided that it was not a select board decision, and I think that we kind of left it that we would let it go to town meeting to make a decision. But I do agree with Amy that without any specificity here, um, it's kind of hard to move forward. So if we 
vote to put it on the warrant and then it can be pulled, then I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we should do because if we're closing the warrant, this is this is it, and we have the option. Well, you always can open it up again. So just so you know, if something were to come up last minute, you're always able to open it up except for two weeks before. Well, I think we should put it on and then get in contact with them and say, what's up? And then we'll know long before the did, warrant is. So did we leave it that the ball is in their court to get funding? I don't think so. We didn't no. leave it in the, it, we did not leave it in there to, to get funding. They had made a commitment they would reach out to local businesses to see okay. if they could support it. So I don't, so. We left it that we would put it on the fall warrant. I believe we did and I, I agree that we also asked them to look for other funding. Right. So. Because we need to know what the warrant's going to say. <laughs> right. So right. we need that additional right. information. So, so we also know is, is there going to be an agreement? What's going to be happening? Is this but, an annual? Yeah. Is it so? But I think it was for us to put it on the warrant. Let's just specify that for a second that it was solely for administrative costs. Yes. Yes. And anything else would be on mm -hmm. their whatever funding they get from businesses, and if they don't get any, it's on them. Right. Right. Yeah, and agree. they, they totally agree, agree with that. Okay. Totally yeah. agree. Then that's, okay. We're only I'm looking for that. administrative costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we need to know if they're even at a place where they they're want up. that. I'll and if not, up. then we don't put it on the mm -hmm. floor. All right, so may have a motion. I'll make a motion to add um, Valley bike proposal to the special town meeting warrant. Second. Pending, right? We're, we're adding it, but we can also remove it. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Okay, we can take it out. All right, cool. We're All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Withholding? All right. Now we'll talk about closing the special town meeting warrant. Yeah, and that's, enclosed. so I know you do not want to go through all of these articles, and, and we still need some more information, but I just wanted to point this out. This is strictly tonight is to close it so that we can finalize some of these articles. Um, uh, so there, we are still looking at specific accounts and what the amounts are going to be. So these are simply, you are looking at a draft with placeholders that we know we're going to be addressing, but I don't have the amounts for you. Um, Article 5 is um, capital requests. Those were requested, uh, approved by capital last night, but it still needs to go to finances, to, to finance committee. Are they meeting tomorrow? Yes. Finance? Yep. Um, Oh, we always have prior year bills to consider. Um, there is an article about the after school program, about a revolving account that was closed to, to I think not last ATM, but the one before. I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll take a look. Um, but we need to do some housekeeping changes there that we, it may have been prematurely closed by the, select, by the town, but it, it's a school revolving account. So I'll, I'll be providing more details on that. Um, there's a placeholder for CPA articles. Uh, right now, Article 9 and Article 10 are regarding two votes that were made on articles at the annual town meeting. The um, Attorney General uh, responded with some recommended changes that needed to be looked at, and we are working with attorney to get that, to get those, uh, the wording accurate. Um, I'm taking off the metal detectors. I spoke with Diana West and the bylaw committee will be reviewing some of these new articles um, and so they want to take a look at it because there's, you know, whenever we get into fines and who's going to enforce it, it gets a little, um, you know, we got we to gotta really do some due diligence looking at that. So that'll be coming off. Um, and then your non-binding referendum for the climate change emergency declaration. So that is it. So I just need you to make a motion that we close the work for special town meeting. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposition? All right. Uh, 
Klamowski APR. Yep, if you remember, this came up at the last meeting and we unfortunately, um, due to personal reasons, we didn't have any representatives to talk about this, but we do have Tina. She has been waiting patiently. There she is. Tina Smith is from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. And so we are co-holders and she's gonna explain it a little bit and then um, you guys can ask her some questions. Thank you for putting this on the agenda tonight. Um, I'm really happy to be here to explain this to you guys. So this APR was closed by Kestrel Land Trust. Um, it was co-funded by the federal government. Kestrel then assigned this APR to both MDAR and the town, which grants um, the town of Hadley co-holder approval. So in this instance, sorry for the background noise, in this instance, um, wells are not considered a retained right as they are in some other APRs. So Ray Young, who owns and farms the property, is working with NRCS and has gotten funding from NRCS to put a well on the property, but they um, they need both co-holder approval and MDAR approval. So um, I don't know if Ray has brought the paperwork by, but I can provide that to you at some point. But simply, this is a request to fill a well on APR land. Certainly, there is other wells on APR and land throughout town. This is only coming to Hadley, the town of Hadley Select Board, as this APR specifically requires um, the town approval for this well, as well as MDAR approval. So, not all APRs require that we approve wells on their land, but this one specifically does. Does MDAR have any issue with this? We do not. Um, we've already approved it. It'll be signed by the commissioner pending town approval. So I agree with part of the discussion here that if it's not able to be watered for more vulnerable extreme conditions like wind and soil erosion. So seems reasonable to me to maintain farming. Mm -hmm. Is there any other discussion? Scott, do you have an opinion on a well? No, this is for Scott McCarthy, our uh, DPW director. Uh, as, as in our previous converse, uh, conversation, there is some concern on the water department's behalf, but under these conditions, I guess it should be granted. Okay, and is there any need for the Board of Health to be looking at this? They responded back and they had no uh, concern. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. So, motion? Uh, are we looking for a motion then to approve this? Yes. Tina, the, the motion itself, just specifically, just that the select board is going to be approving this, correct? Yes, well, so I want to it, but then I need a signature. I looked back through our records, and it looks like the last time the town was a focal ground something is assigned by Molly Keegan. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I can bring this paperwork to the town of Hadley, but I don't know where to bring it to or um, when. We can touch base tomorrow, Tina. Okay, perfect. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right, so I have a motion to approve. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Withstanding? All right, passes. Other items not anticipated 48 hours in advance? Town Administrator, anything new and exciting? Um, it's always exciting, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I, as like I said, I was solo this week. I did have some help with Peter and Sue helped me out with some things. But um, I did want to just uh, make sure everybody knew that the area, Amherst Area Chamber was inviting you all to a grand opening ribbon cutting for Fun Hub Action Park. Uh, which is going to be Friday, September 30th from 12 to 2. The ribbon cutting's at 12.30. And those are only the announcements I have. I do want to let you know, uh, I did reach out to the ch uh, Cable Charter Review Committee. I only got a couple responses, um, so I'm going to give them phone calls this, this week. Uh, but we may be looking for some committee members. 
So. Okay. And Attorney Mead is going to begin doing office hours. She has picked up two other communities that are close by. Um, she will be here October 24th between 1 and 3 holding office hours. I have not yet. I, that was just this afternoon, so I haven't let um, board members know or department heads. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of what that. What does that mean? She's going to come, and if you have questions for her, we get to go. You'll be in person. You can be there in person. Okay, cool. Yeah, you just can't take up the whole two hours. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that Route 9 had a tough week, lots of traffic, uh, right, at, right at middle and uh, um, Russell, it was it was a busy, busy week, but nice. It was much quieter today, but things are moving along, and uh, yeah. Our business and then owners. Did you want to clear up any confusion about the two events happening tomorrow hey. and what each one of them is, and yes, what voters with opinions which ones they should go to? Mm. It's. Yeah. Who does? Susan. Oh. Yeah. Susan, okay. did you have a question? Sorry, I'm acting like a board member. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I meant to uh, update you that the Board of Trustees of earlier today that the streetlight project, the replacement project, should be done tomorrow afternoon. Yep. I, w I was just skipping all the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Yes. Do you right. want to talk about the select boards of right. first? So number nine is a new um, category we're going to have here on all the time, as is number 10. Which oh, is I'm, I'm sorry, Jane. I'm, I'm ju I, I was referring to um, Amy had asked about two events. Oh, I'm um, sorry. So I'm yes. just clarifying that there is an event by the Climate Change Committee. The Climate Change Committee is holding the event that the select board asked them to hold for town input about the climate change declaration that they would like the select board to sign. So that'll be informational, and then it will actually go to special town meeting in the fall. But it's also a public forum. It's a public forum. It is a public, public forum, not just informational. So yes. it is allowing for questions, comments, and opinions. Yes, absolutely. The other event is an informational session. The other event is um, a workshop for the agricultural communities in the Mill and Fort River watersheds. It's water and strategies for our changing climate. Um, it, its main heading is drought relief for local farmers that will be the same time, 6 to 8, on this Thursday, September 22nd, at the Young Man's Club on 138 East Street, Hadley. The climate change resolution um, that will be held here, correct? Yes. Correct. From 6 to 8, and it is posted as a select board meeting, um, but it is being put on by the Climate Change Committee. Now, is that 6 to 8 hard time? Or if it seems to be done, then they would close early. Which one? The um, I can't public, speak for. I don't oh, know. The I can't speak for either of them here. Well, I assume if it's done, will be done. Right. So scheduled six to eight. I'm just thinking of if I'm a farmer and I have an opinion, which one do I go to? And it would be better to maybe come here first and then go to the other one if there's. A voice that you would like to be heard, right? Make sense? Uh -huh. Yeah, I can't speak. For, I can't that? speak for because there's no um, guarantee this is going to eight. Essentially, right. And I think right. They're presenting. First. They're presenting first, yeah. mm -hmm. so we don't know when the when the comments will start being received. Okay. Of course. Right. We hope you will yeah, all attend. Yeah. It, it is. It's just interesting. Yeah, it's too bad they both got scheduled on the same day. Oddly interesting. Yes. All right. So That's number it. nine is an item that will be here henceforth, which is if any of us have anything that we feel should be on the agenda or topics that we want to discuss, this is the time that we would mention that. It's also a time for select board member liaison reports if anything is happening with any of your liaison committees that you feel is important, you should speak up. Okay. 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 Um, I, anything else? I have an announcement. Do you want us to mention anything in that oh, regard? Oh, yeah. Do you have anything Just you would like to add? Just very quickly, because yes. I know it's late. Um, so the housing production 
uh, plan. Uh, their survey um, is fine, has been finalized, so they're in the process of, um, they've actually compiled the initial results from that. And there is going to be a public information session scheduled. Um, they're working out tentative dates right now, but the decision was to have that via Zoom so that as many people as possible could participate if they want to listen um, to find out what, that, um, what the survey results are. So that's all being handled right now by uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission with input from the Housing Production Plan work group. Um, so yeah, so more to come on that, but um, we'll definitely be trying to get word out on that and that'll be happening in October. Okay. The Hadley Cultural Council is seeking funding proposals. They have set October 17th, 2022 deadline for organizations, schools, individuals to apply for grants that support cultural activities in the community of Hadley. The council prioritizes community-oriented arts, humanities, and science program and entertainment for people of all ages, backgrounds, cultures, and abilities. Council spokesperson Dina Friedman states these grants will support a variety of artistic projects and activities, including exhibits, festivals, field trips, short-term artist residencies, and performances in schools, workshops, and lectures in Hadley. This year, the Hadley Cultural Council will distribute an overall amount of $5,000 in grants. In the past, grant amounts generally have been from $200 to $600. Previously funded projects included dance and music performances along with rug making at the Goodwin Memorial Library, summer music series at the Porter Huntington House and the Summit House, juggling entertainment at the elementary school, art performances and instructions held at the Winters Farmer Market in New Hampshire Mall, Project Earth, a community art exhibit displayed in conjunction with First Hadley Climate Day, Joy of Song sing-alongs at the Hadley Senior Center, Hadley's Poet Laureate Program, and more. Anyone interested can contact Dina Friedman or look at the Hadley Cultural Council at gmail.com. The deadline again is October 17th. Anything else? May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.